all have a common human feeling for the planet. And I think the International Conservation Caucus and the Oceans Caucus have been able to bring Republicans and Democrats together around that feeling of care for our common home in ways that fend off the partisan and divisive impulses so often uh, contaminate this town. The International Conservation Caucus and the Oceans Caucus are, I think, the two most effective ways for us in Congress to take what uh, politics is described as the art of the possible, to take what is possible and make it actually happen. We are really excited about the ocean conservation piece of this. Um, humans are terrestrial beings, and we don't have a very good sense of what's going on in the oceans. So the extent of the plastic waste that is all over the oceans is something that an ordinary person wouldn't know about. The acidification changes that we're seeing, the death of coral reefs, the oceans are sending out extraordinary signals of distress and the Oceans Caucus allows us to focus on those signals and pay attention and try to find uh, remedies and I've got to say I am really proud of the work that the Oceans Caucus did on pirate fishing we passed four treaties in one afternoon and you had to go back nine years to find the previous four treaties that the Senate had passed and we did the legislation the enabling legislation to support those treaties and that was all done in a very bipartisan, indeed unanimous consent type way. So we have successes under our belt already. And the hearing that we held on marine debris was very bipartisan, very promising, and we are at work trying to develop a legislative strategy. The issues that my founding co-chair, Senator Murkowski, and I, along with the other co-chairs, have developed are, were first pirate fishing, and I think on that one we can say job well done. Second, marine debris, and we've begun with those very bipartisan hearings and with very good committee work. And the third is how to better do ocean data monitoring, and we're working on that as well. So those are three issues we've already agreed to work on where, where there's considerable progress already been made and the promise of more progress ahead. These conservation issues are powerful ways for America to enhance its role and its reputation in the world. A lot of this stuff gets a little complicated when you're dealing with ecosystem and multi-species complexities and to expect a artisanal fisherman off the coast of Ghana to figure that out for himself is asking a lot. But that fisherman knows that something is wrong. And if they also know that the United States has come and through these conservation strategies has made their life better, that's a lasting value for our country. The role of the private sector and the success of the International Conservation Caucus and the Ocean Caucus, I think, has been considerable. It has provided reassurance to a number of our participants that they're not going off on some wild, you know, government jaunt. Um, but it also brings a lot of discipline uh, from the very affected corporations and in some cases some real passion. Uh, the bumblebee tuna folks don't do well if the tuna is extirpated from the ocean and companies like Mars are deeply, deeply interested in protecting their supply chains for various products. So they come to this with a very positive motivation. It's not us versus them. It's all pulling together. As a child, um, I lived with my family in Thailand, where we were posted. And we had the opportunity to dive in the Andaman Sea uh, off of Phuket, which is now a very big resort, but was then just a tiny little place with one hotel. And as soon as you went underwater, offshore there, you were in paradise. And my family went back just a few years ago. My wife is a marine scientist, and she reported to me that almost all of the coral was dead, that the paradise was destroyed, and that um, is a very hard thing to recover from. Uh, we also hosted 
in Newport, Rhode Island just a year ago, probably the most dangerous and challenging sporting event on the planet, which is the round the world Volvo ocean race. And when the sailors came in, they reported that even in the deep South Atlantic, thousands of miles from any land, they were having to do regular drills on the boat to clear junk plastic off of the keel because the junk plastic was inhibiting the performance of the boat. Now, sailors and racers all know about man overboard drills, but it's new to open ocean sailing to have to worry about keel clearing drills. And that was a pretty strong signal of how badly we have junked up our oceans with plastic. America's impact is profound, and it is my, and many others, fervent hope that you will continue to inspire others, both at home and on the global stage. I grew, I, 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 I grew up in a village, and when I was growing up, when I was young, there used to be huge forests around there. At night you hear lions rolling, you had so many animals around. But because we are close to Dar es Salaam, to meet the charcoal demands for Dar es Salaam, all this forest is gone. All this forest is gone. We have come to realize that it is in our interest to make sure that we deal with the issue of environment because it's affecting us. Thank you to ICCF and to all of you for supporting wildlife conservation. The struggle to take on these great causes isn't a Republican cause, it isn't a Democratic cause, it is about right and wrong. It isn't merely an African struggle, it is an American struggle, it is a global struggle. He came to me years ago talking about this caucus in Africa and he was trying to get me to go for, I don't know, eight or ten years and I finally went. And I've never been the same since. I want to thank the International Conservation Caucus for its leadership in driving policy and awareness and action both here at home and around the world. And I remember sitting down at that time with David Barron and Clay Shaw was there and I said, you know, if we formed an International Conservation Caucus, we would be able, long after we're gone, to continue to drive policy because there would be a caucus there to make certain that the terms of this agreement were kept. Our, our dream was to get all of us to cooperate on an international basis and that has grown magnificently. The needs to protect the abundance of our resources to do it with market-based conservatism. It's given to recognize the leaders that use business to inspire solutions to our world's environmental crises. And we've recognized that it is us, the seafood industry, that needs to lead the development and implementation of meaningful conservation policies to ensure not only a valuable source of protein for future generations, 
but also to ensure the continuation of our own business. By 2015, we will meet the goal to give 2 million Africans access to safe, clean drinking water. We need to be thinking marketplace solutions. We can't be thinking emotionally. We can't be thinking hysterically. We have got to use logic. At events like tonight, and the work that all of you have done on behalf of ocean conservation is securing a better future for our planet. And I'm proud to tell you tonight that through that legislation, we have managed to protect over 17 million acres of tropical forests around the world. That's pretty good. It's a binational conservation area that will bring together both the northern part of the Mexican side on the Rio Bravo and the southern side to create what will be nearly a three million acre binational conservation area. You can also count on Mexico to preserve our common environmental assets, honoring in this way the legacy of President Teddy Roosevelt. As you debate, as you shape legislation that will help ensure our future, I implore you to be bold and to place humanity and nature ahead of politics. Good morning, and thank you for joining today's congressional briefing on rainforest conservation. We're wishing everyone a happy Arbor Day here at the International Conservation Caucus Foundation. Thank you for your support for forest conservation. Our conversation today is part of ICCF Group's Energies and Forest Program, through which we convene key members of Congress, administration officials, other stakeholders to advance constructive, bipartisan policy solutions that support the environment. Our purpose is to explore areas of bipartisan consensus within conservation and climate. 
ICCF Group serves as the secretariat to a number of important conservation caucuses here in the U.S. and across the globe, including the International Conservation Caucus in the House and Senate and the Senate Climate Solutions Caucus. To learn more, please go to our website, internationalconservation.org. I'm Chrissy Harbin, our Capitol Hill Program Director. We have a great program today, so I'll provide a brief roadmap and then we'll jump right in. First, we'll hear remarks from Senator Rob Portman of Ohio. He's worked closely with a bipartisan and bicameral group in Congress to advance common sense climate solutions. Second, we'll hear keynote remarks from the Norwegian climate minister, Mr. Sengyung Rotevan. He will share insights about the leadership role that Norway is currently playing on the global stage. In the last part of our, of our program, we'll convene a conversation with two experts who both have significant experience in international climate change policy with FOSI on forests and trade. Diana Movius is the Director of Global Forest Policy at Climate Advisors, and Rick Jacobson is the Manager of Com Commodities Policy in the U.S. Office of the Environmental Investigation Agency. We look forward to hearing their reactions and insights. Many thanks to everyone participating today. To begin, I'd like to invite pre-recorded comments from Senator Rob Portman of Ohio, who has a strong track record of working across party lines to ensure that our natural resources are protected and preserved for the future. Mr. Portman is co-chair of the International Conservation Caucus and a key member of the Senate Climate Solutions Caucus. He's working with Senators Coons, Burr, White House, and Schatz on bipartisan conservation legislation to protect tropical forests and coral reef ecosystems, a bill whose companion recently passed the House of Representatives with unanimous consent. He's also working with Senator Stabenow on the Replant Act, which promotes reforestation following unplanned events on federal lands. Senator Portman kindly sent us pre-recorded remarks in advance of our conversation, which we're grateful to show now. Hi, I'm U.S. Senator Rob Portman. Thanks to the ICCF, the International Conservation Caucus Foundation, for inviting me to speak with you all at today's congressional briefing. I appreciate all the work ICCF does every single day to advance the cause of international conservation to ensure we're leaving a cleaner world for our future generations. I'm proud to be your partner as co-chair of the Senate International Conservation Caucus and as a member of the Senate Climate Solutions Caucus. In honor of Arbor Day, a day when we celebrate the importance of trees to our health, economy, and ecosystems, I'd like to talk for a minute about the Tropical Forest Conservation Act. This is a debt for nature program that has helped protect more than 67 million acres of tropical forests in 14 different countries around the world since its passage in the House of Representatives, where I authored this legislation 23 years ago. The Tropical Forest Conservation Act allows developing countries to relieve or restructure concessional debt owed to the United States to generate funds for tropical forest or coral reef conservation. Tropical forests play a key role in protecting our environment by helping sequester carbon dioxide and provide so many other benefits. In particular, tropical forests are a really important carbon sink 67 million acres that this program has protected has sequestered 56 million metric tons of carbon dioxide, which is equivalent, I'm told, of taking nearly 12 million cars off the road for a year. So the program has already done great things and more to come. These debt for nature swaps help developing countries also by improving their balance sheets. They help by, by doing that to provide funding for important conservation projects and are a valuable way to engage with our partners and strengthen our relationships around the world. We work with Conservation International, World Wildlife Fund, the Nature Conservancy, and other groups to leverage private money as well. By the way, this all works without risking a single American job or coming at any significant cost to the U.S. taxpayer. It's a win-win-win program, the kind of common sense bipartisan solution that benefits all of us. And I thank the ICCF for its consistent, strong support over the years. Now I'm working with my fellow ICCF co-chair, Senator Chris Coons, on bipartisan legislation to reauthorize the Tropical Forest Act for another five years. It's the next step in utilizing this powerful conservation tool to protect our natural environment and reduce our carbon footprint. In addition to continuing these international efforts, I've also introduced bipartisan legislation, effective, uh, very effective to help with regard to Arbor Day, called the Replant Act to help replant our forest land here at home following natural disasters like wildfires or droughts. The Replant Act, by the way, is expected to plant a total of 
4.1 million acres or 1.2 billion trees over the next 10 years. And that will also create about 50,000 jobs. So I appreciate ICCF's support there as well and their continued partnership and dedication to conservation worldwide. And to everyone who's here today to help advance this important mission of conservation, thank you and Godspeed in your important work. Many thanks to Senator Portman for his comments and for his leadership in Congress. Next, I'd like to turn to our keynote speaker, the Minister of Climate and the Environment of the Government of Norway, Mr. Sveingan Rotevan. He has a long experience as a government leader in working with developing countries and promoting tropical forests. He serves as the Minister of Climate and the Environment, and he's also the first deputy leader of the Liberal Party in Norway. He previously served as the state secretary at the same department before coming minister, so he has certainly played a key role in his, in his country's efforts. Mr. Minister, thank you for joining us and sharing your time and insights today. Uh, I'd love to invite you to share your perspective on Norway's efforts in conservation before we jump to a fireside chat. And as always, for our folks watching, in the meantime, uh, please use uh, the chat box that you see in the, on the side of your screen to answer any questions that, that you would like to pose during our conversation today. Uh, we'll pull questions from this chat box into our conversation. Mr. Minister, please. Thanks, Chrissy. Good morning, everyone. Uh, and thank you very much to the International Conservation Caucus for inviting me to speak uh, this morning. I am very pleased to learn about your bipartisan efforts to conserve nature. Every day, due to deforestation, we lose species we didn't even know existed. Rainforests contain more than half of the world's documented species. And the rainforests secure millions of livelihoods for indigenous peoples and local communities around the world. As a source of fresh water, these forests are critical for the world's food production. The Amazon water pump even provides rain to the food belt in the Midwest of the United States. Now, the UN has warned that continued deforestation might bring us to the next pandemic through increased human contact with wildlife. For all these reasons, the Pentagon and NATO are increasingly seeing deforestation and climate change as a security threat multiplier. And we cannot solve the climate crisis without protecting our tropical forests. Let me stress that again. Climate policy it not, is not just energy policy. Yes, we need to transform the energy system, but that won't be enough. We will not reach the temperature goals of the Paris Agreement without rapid and deep cuts in deforestation. It is a paradox that while we invest billions of dollars into new technologies to capture carbon from the air, we don't invest nearly enough in protecting known technology that works today, rainforests. Over the last decade, Norway's International Climate and Forest Initiative has invested about $3 billion in efforts to protect tropical forests, about 10% of our aid budget. Our parliament has already decided to extend it until 2030. While we have supported more than 70 countries, uh, most funding goes to our large bilateral results-based partnerships. So what we do is we pay countries after they have demonstrated reductions in deforestation overall, not in a single location, but across their territory. We have found this method to work well. The countries set their national priorities and we only pay out if they deliver. And that's also something that our taxpayers like. And I think it brings integrity to the whole program. The payments reward achieved results and are then spent on activities to deliver further emission cuts. We have paid $1.2 billion into Brazil's Amazon fund as they managed to reduce deforestation in the Amazon by 80% in a decade. This remains one of the largest climate successes globally. Brazil applied its best-in-class scientific monitoring of deforestation to guide a highly successful law enforcement effort to end impunity in the Amazon. 
They established protected areas and indigenous territories, and they regulated forests on private lands to stimulate investments in productivity rather than expansion into forests. They froze credit to municipalities with high deforestation. Now, I am concerned by the reversals of Brazil's successful policies over the last years, but I'm nevertheless hopeful that they can repeat their success story again. We have also pledged $1 billion to Indonesia, which has reduced deforestation drastically four years in a row, which is a remarkable success that too few are aware of. Indonesia's success story too is a result of successful policy, much like Brazil did in the past. Protecting forests and carbon-rich peatlands while ramping up law enforcement. We have also entered into similar partnerships with a number of other countries committed to stopping deforestation, including Colombia, Peru, Guyana, Ecuador, Congo, Gabon, Ethiopia, and Liberia. Although we have made important strides, rainforests keep disappearing at an alarming rate. The reasons vary, but there is one common feature. For the individual farmer or the individual company, deforestation almost always pays off. And even when individual actors decide to protect their forests, deforestation quickly moves somewhere else if allowed. This is rarely in the national economic interest. Protecting forests and investments in a prosperous rural economy is also of vital importance. While fighting illegalities is most important in many countries, elsewhere it is about providing jobs for a poor and rapidly increasing rural population. This is particularly true for the Congo Basin, which holds the world's second biggest rainforest. Be it regulations or jobs, reducing deforestation comes at a cost, a political cost and a financial cost. A global partnership is therefore needed to support the countries that succeed. Hence, I was thrilled about our joint announcement at President Biden's climate summit last week. Together with the US, the UK, and a group of large companies, including tech giants, uh, Amazon, Salesforce, and Airbnb, major food companies like Unilever, Nestle, and Bayer, the healthcare company GSK and consulting firms McKinsey and BCG, we together launched the LEAF Coalition. This innovative initiative will mobilize significant resources, initially $1 billion this year, to reward countries that reduce deforestation over the next five years. The LEAF Coalition requires ambitious climate targets from the companies participating. It will use a robust method to measure that results are real and with an emphasis on social inclusion. Indigenous peoples and local communities must not only be heard, they must benefit from this. And this isn't just only socially just, it is also effective. Evidence shows that indigenous peoples tend to be the best guardians of the forests. Norway has therefore had a particular focus on protecting their rights. So far, I've talked about the importance of providing support and incentives to tropical forest countries and the people who live there. But we must also work to limit our own deforestation footprint. Every time you buy groceries, you contribute to tropical deforestation. Global demand for commodities such as beef, soy, palm, oil, pulp and paper, rubber and coffee, currently drives deforestation. Increasingly, customers don't want it to be like that. And luckily, it doesn't. With the right market signals, the markets would produce the same commodities and more without expanding into forests. The market could help countries reduce deforestation rather than hamper their efforts. 
leading companies in the United States and around the world have pledged to eliminate deforestation from their supply chains. Alongside the US and others, we've been working hard to support the leading companies and to bring others along. Some have taken serious action. Others are lagging behind. Leading companies that demand deforestation-free products from their suppliers want the level playing field. And to avoid that their suppliers sell deforestation risk commodities to other companies and markets that don't ask questions. That is why the European Union is preparing regulations to limit the imports of unsustainable agricultural commodities. And the United Kingdom has proposed its own regulations banning the imports of illegally produced agricultural commodities. This helps producer countries enact reforms and uphold their laws to protect their forests. Illegal deforestation is a persistent and pervasive issue. The UN estimates that forest crimes is comparable in size with the global cocaine industry. It undermines democracies, human rights, tax collection, and economic development. We are working hard with the United States, with Interpol, with the UN Office of Drugs and Crimes, and others in the global fight against illegal logging. But it's not only international crime cartels that profit from deforestation. So do you and I. It's hard to invest your savings or pensions in the global stock market without financing deforestation. That too has to end. Companies, investors, and banks have previously lacked the tools to adequately address risk of deforestation in their portfolios. To fill this void, we support comprehensive collection of company-level deforestation risk data in a standardized format usable to investors. It will only make a difference if investors are keen to monitor this risk. I'm therefore delighted to see the recent signals from the United States to promote climate-related financial risk disclosures. Put simply, we must require companies to disclose their climate footprint, including those stemming from the commodities that they buy. Lastly, I would like to talk about technology. New technology can support both forest countries committed to grow their economies with less deforestation and companies that want to be sustainable. Over the years, Norway has invested heavily in technologies that promote transparency. Data about where and when deforestation is happening, about what drives it, about who's behind it. The World Resources Institute in Washington revolutionized deforestation data with their Global Forest Watch. Last year, we took one step further and we produced high resolution satellite images from California-based Planet Labs, Airbus, and the Norwegian satellite firm KSAT, and made them universally accessible. So now everyone anywhere can access detailed satellite imagery of all tropical forests for free, updated every month. First and foremost, this helps forest country governments to better monitor their forests and to prioritize their actions but it can also help them measure results in reducing deforestation with lower uncertainty and access the increasing funds from companies willing to pay for reduced deforestation. This data will also allow for commodity buyers to monitor their supplier sustainability performance. And it will also allow civil society or indigenous groups or individuals to hold companies accountable. So in conclusion, we need to end tropical deforestation this decade if we are to meet global climate goals. To do this, collaboration will be key. Tropical forest countries need our support 
to make tough decisions at home, to support farmers and to strengthen communities. And we need the support and the innovation of the global business community. U.S. leadership will be essential to deliver all of these. I look forward to further deepen our very strong cooperation with the U.S. on tropical forest issues. And I am delighted to see the bipartisan collaboration expressed by the uh, International Conservation Caucus in our joint all important mission to conserve the world's valuable natural wealth. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Minister. The Norwegian government is certainly taking some big steps on combating tropical deforestation and supporting innovation. And it's great to learn more about your leadership and partnership. I'd love to ask you a few questions while we still have you. Um, first, I'd, I'd love to hear more about your takeaway from participating in the White House's recent uh, summit uh, around Earth Day. You were one of the countries that played a major role and you talked about uh, some of the recent announcements that came out of it. I'd love to hear some more of your insights following that engagement. Sure, well, I think uh, there, there, there is no doubt that the uh, summit itself um, um, was very important both to get key actors together and also to see countries raise their climate ambitions. And, you know, just last week, uh, Chrissy, we saw uh, the UK deliver an enhanced NDC to uh, increase their ambitions. Uh, we saw Japan get on board. We saw the EU finalizing its enhanced emission target. And of course, we saw the US uh, launching its own enhanced emission target. So that's all great news. Uh, also, other important initiatives uh, were launched. Uh, I participated at a couple of meetings last week. Uh, I think, uh, for, for example, one of the meetings uh, where uh, we discussed uh, action when it comes to the oceans was uh, very encouraging indeed. Also to hear... Uh, uh, Special Envoy um, Kerry uh, uh, make a uh, solid stand uh, saying that the, the United States now will support uh, uh, green shipping at the IMO uh, and a very ambitious 2050 target. That was great news. And I think also that the initiative that we launched together, the US, Norway and the UK, along with the companies that I mentioned, the LEAF initiative, was also great news for tropical forests. So all in all, uh, it was a great week, uh, but we still have a lot of work ahead, especially heading into the two very important events happening this fall, the uh, meeting on biodiversity in Kunming, China, and of course, the COP, the climate COP in Glasgow at the end of fall. So we have a lot of work ahead of us, but uh, uh, last week was certainly reason for optimism. Mm -hmm. Yes, lot, lots of good news that came out of it. Um, I'd love to ask more about the LEAF Coalition. I know you mentioned it during your keynote comments and just now too. Um, could you talk a little bit more about how this initiative will work in practice and perhaps how this LEAF Coalition may be different than other recent initiatives? Um, generally, I'm, I'm really curious for your thoughts on how the public and private sectors can work together on these important issues. Sure. Um, so um, for, for the last 15 years, uh, Norway has been doing a lot of work on uh, reducing deforestation. And we have also, I think, in that process, uh, gained a lot of experience on what works and what doesn't work and what needs to be done. Uh, and in our experience, where we need to go is we need to have results-based payments to countries that are willing to commit. Uh, that works. Uh, what doesn't work is... Uh, you know, uh, seeing deforestation reduced in one part of a country, whereas it just increases in another part of the country. So you need to have uh, result-based payments on a country level. Uh, Norway has spent a lot of money on this uh, in our partnerships with Brazil, Indonesia, etc. Uh, but we're a small country uh, and we need a lot of more funding on the table. Uh, what we see is that there is a great uh, call for action among global companies, they want to commit to stop deforestation, they want to do something, they want to fund it, but they need to know that it's actually result-based and that, that what they're paying for has high integrity. And that is what the LEAF Coalition is all about. So uh, we're setting up mechanisms 
uh, that will uh, make sure that companies know that the deforestation that they're funding is real, that it helps preserve biodiversity and reduce emissions, and also that the money goes into supporting further initiatives, both when it comes to indigenous people's rights and protecting forests. What's also important is that the companies are committing to reduce their own emissions, so they're not just paying for others to reduce their emissions, so that's a good thing, I think. And what we need to see happening now is to get both more countries on board, uh, but especially more companies. And I think there is a will to do that. They just need to see that this works. I can tell you that it does. We've been uh, working like this for many years, and we're very happy to see now that both the US is solidly on board and that a lot of important global companies are on board as well. So I think this is a great initiative. $1 billion is a good start, but we need it to grow and grow in the coming years if we are to succeed in the next decade in stopping deforestation. Mm -hmm. Yep, good, good progress. Um, I, I'm attracted to the idea of results-based partnerships. Uh, you've, you've talked a lot about this, and my understanding was that Brazil was the first country that Norway entered into a results-based partnership in 2008. I'm um, mm -hmm. wondering if you could speak a little bit more about how this relationship has evolved over the years and maybe what lessons learned you've had from your Brazil partnership and what the future of this relationship looks like. Sure. So um, when we first entered into our partnership with uh, Brazil about 15 years ago, um, uh, it was what would later become a great success story. Um, so we've been cooperating with Brazil on uh, exact exactly what I described in my previous answer, which is result-based payments. So they have to document that they're reducing deforestation levels, and this needs to be uh, better and better and better uh, as the years go by. And then we uh, pay out uh, into uh, this vehicle that we set up that's called the Amazon Fund. Uh, and the money from the Amazon Fund goes to further support uh, uh, important local projects. Uh, it supports uh, law enforcement and all that's needed on the ground. As everyone knows, uh, the uh, change uh, in government in Brazil uh, with their new president uh, and the new regime that was put in place a couple of years ago um, changed Brazil's policies towards uh, deforestation. Um, what was uh, quite serious, seen from a Norwegian standpoint, was that they changed the setup of the Amazon Fund uh, to have it governed a different way, which was not acceptable to us or our partner country, Germany, that's also part of this. So what happened two years ago was that we froze the accounts uh, on in the fund and said that we will not be making any more payments uh, until we solve this issue. Um, and we are still um, holding out and we're still uh, in, in, in discussions with Brazilian authorities, but what we're saying to them is that we need to see a political will and results in reducing deforestation, in stopping illegal logging, in stopping illegal mining and farming, and all that's going on, which has results in increased deforestation levels. And I mean, uh, we, we, we've been having good um, uh, discussions with our partners at a political level in Brazil, uh, but unfortunately, we're still not seeing the action that's needed. So I think it's important now to keep working with Brazil and to see that they get back on track because Brazil has been a remarkable success story and they've been able to, in the past, reduce deforestation while increasing agricultural output, while increasing jobs, while increasing productivity and economic performance. So these things aren't mutually, uh, mutually uh, uh, um, um, uh, impossible to do. I mean, you can do these things, you can combine them. Uh, and that's our message to the Brazilian government. And hopefully they will uh, get back on track sooner rather than later. But uh, it's important to state also that we're still seeing great results from our cooperation with other countries like Indonesia. So still there's a lot of positive things happening, but we need to see more uh, action on the ground in Brazil for sure. Mm -hmm. well, thank you for that update. Now, we shared the concern over the illegal extraction of resources at ICCF, so it's, it's, it's great to hear uh, about your experience. Uh, we have time for one last question. Uh, Brazil, it's uh, result-based payments. It's close cooperation on stopping uh, illegal deforestation to get systems in place, law enforcement. Uh, and I think that the impressive results in Indonesia uh, need to be uh, told more often. They've been able to reduce deforestation quite drastically 
four years in a row. That's great news for Indonesia, but also the world. And what they've been able to do is put in place national moratoria, for example, for uh, for uh, peatlands and uh, an expansion into the rainforest to produce palm oil. Uh, and all of those initiatives are now really proving to uh, show some great results. So our cooperation within in Indonesia is something that we're uh, quite proud of. And I think Indonesia is also quite proud of their um, great results. And hopefully this will continue and inspire other countries as well. I think that's a great message. Uh, well, we have to stop it here, but we appreciate uh, your time, uh, Mr. Mr. Minister, very much. Thank you for um, being with us today and sharing your insights. We appreciate your, your partnership in, in preserving tropical forests. Thank you. Thank you, Chrissy. In our third and final part of our program, we have two experts who both have significant experience in international climate and trade policy. Diana Movius is the Director of Global Forest Policy at Climate Advisors, where she focuses on mitigating deforestation through international climate policy, climate finance, and supply chains. She's held many important roles in this space, including at the World Bank, the UN Forum on Forests, and the Center for Clean Air Policy. Uh, interestingly, Diana also previously lived in and worked in the Peruvian Amazon researching community-based ecotourism, so she has a lot of on-the-ground experience. Uh, Rick D Jacobson, uh, our other expert panelist, is the manager of commodities policy at the Environmental Investigation Agency, where he works on addressing commodities-driven deforestation and also leads many of his group's international efforts, uh, including in Brazil and throughout Asia. Um, previous to EIA, Rick led many international forestry efforts at Global Witness for over 10 years, uh, focusing on exposing and addressing uh, many of the uh, harms to forest and indigenous communities that uh, we've discussed uh, today. Uh, Diane and Rick, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, before we dive into q and I would love to get your initial reactions on some of the remarks that we heard today, um, Senator Portman and the Norwegian climate minister. Uh, Diana, would you like to start and then we'll, we'll go hear from Rick? Sure. Uh, thanks, Chrissy, and thanks so much for having me on today's briefing. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, I thought both remarks were excellent and highlighted really important points. Um, I was really pleased to see Senator Portman highlighting some of the flagship U.S. efforts in depth for nature swaps and also what the U.S. can do at home in terms of replanting and contributing to our own um, nature-based solutions here in the U.S. I think uh, Minister Radfan really highlighted the importance that addressing um, and stopping and eventually reversing tropical deforestation requires not only the leadership of the host country, but also the leadership of developed countries like Norway and the US. And particularly that um, it is costly for developing countries to reduce their deforestation. And they need to see essentially a light at the tunnel. At the end of the tunnel, they need to understand that if they are able to measurably reduce deforestation, there will be a financial compensation. And that's why Norway's leadership in this area through results-based payments has really provided a roadmap for other countries to follow. And the U.S. has contributed to uh, several results-based funds at the World Bank and others, and also its own bilateral initiatives. Um, in addition, uh, the cost issue uh, has been a major impediment to reducing deforestation over the past 10 years. And the LEAF coalition that uh, the minister highlighted that uh, attracts private sector funding um, to to rewarding tropical forest countries for reducing deforestation, I think will provide a game-changing amount of finance. So uh, in short, my quick reactions are, um, it's important for us to, to act at home for forests as Senator Portman described. It's also very important for us to continue to strengthen and expand international partnerships with other developed countries so that uh, collectively we can help tropical forest countries reduce deforestation. Great, thank you for those insights. Uh, Rick, would love to hear from yours as well. Sure, well, uh, just to add to uh, what Diana said, uh, we're, you know, we really appreciate uh, Senator Portman's longstanding support for efforts to, to bring more resources to tropical forest for, uh, conservation and the uh, Tropical Forest Conservation Act has been an important tool in doing that. And then of course, Norway has been so central to global efforts to try and address deforestation, you know, over the last decades. So, so um, you know, hugely grateful for that. And uh, I was especially, uh, you know, happy to hear the minister uh, highlight the importance of 
indigenous peoples and local communities who you know wake up every day on the front lines and are are our uh, most important allies in, in some of these efforts and they're often not getting resources they need and in some cases are even facing you know a hostile environment both because of the prevalence of, of criminal activity you know that, that's related to deforestation and also in some cases like what we're seeing in Brazil right now uh, a government that's actually showing hostility to their interests. Uh, I think it's also important that the, the LEAF initiative is a, a, a systemic one and, and just recognizing that in the end in order to solve these problems we need uh, you know, governance reforms. You know, so often there's corruption and, and, and crime at the center of deforestation. And in order to address that, you need, you need systemic solutions. And so the, the emphasis of the LEAF program on, on providing that kind of results-based systemic uh, 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 you know, uh, incentives is really important. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I thought it was really interesting to hear the minister talk about that in particular. Um, it's, it's not just a matter of losing trees. There's a, a lot of other um, important issues um, like, like solving, uh, solving crime as well. Um, now, I'm curious, uh, given both of your backgrounds in um, international climate policy, I know you, you, you have significant knowledge on, on trade issues. Are there trade policies that perhaps contribute to deforestation that our audience might not be aware of? Curious for your thoughts. Sure, should I kick that one off? Yeah, it sounds like you have real expertise here, Rick. Right, thanks. Uh, um, yeah, again, I was, I was really uh, pleased to hear the minister highlight the importance of global trade in deforestation. Uh, the most deforestation, like more than two thirds of it is being driven by commercial agriculture. And the majority of all of those commodities being produced end up on international markets. And the US is, it has one of the biggest footprints in that sense. So it's important to complement these initiatives that are providing resources for, for addressing deforestation with ones that, that make sure our trade policies aren't actually undermining those same efforts by you know, buying uh, products that may be produced from illegal logging or, or illegal deforestation. So, um, you know, one, one thing that I wanted to highlight is uh, an, a, a tool that already exists in the U.S., which is the Lacey Act, uh, which prohibits the import of illegal timber into the U.S. And uh, that, that's, that's an, uh, a, a, an amendment that was put into place uh, under the Bush administration and had broad bipartisan support. Uh, and, and also industry and labor support in the U.S. recognizing that in the end, illegal timber and illegal trade is, is not helpful in, in, in creating a, a level playing field and fair competition uh, globally. So um, we think it's an important precedent uh, in, in how the U.S. can take action at home to, to help uh, address these issues through the, the leverage that our, our market um, provides. And... Um, we're, we're encouraged that right now uh, there's a, a recent announce, announcement uh, by Senator Schatz and, and Representative Blumenauer uh, about the intention to expand those efforts to uh, apply to other commodities that, that are being produced through, through illegal deforestation. Uh, and these, these include um, going beyond timber to things like uh, beef and leather, uh, given that, that ca cattle, the cattle industry is the biggest driver of deforestation in the Amazon. Uh, soy, palm oil, uh, and so forth, cocoa. So um, th there's a lot more we can do through trade to make sure that uh, you know U.S. Uh, trade policy is is aligning with the these incentive programs that, that are being set up. I'm glad you brought up the Lacey Act because I think it's a great example of a um, bipartisan cooperation. Uh, on, on this issue, uh, a Bush era um, initiative that finds support currently within both political parties. Um, Diana, I'm curious for your thoughts here. Do you see forests as an area for increasing bipartisan cooperation? And what should um, our Hill audience, um, the US policymakers and in Congress and also in the Biden administration keep in mind as they work across the aisle and with international partners in stopping deforestation? Thanks, Chrissy. That's a great question. And the short answer is yes, uh, it's definitely an area for bipartisan cooperation. You've seen that historically um, through, the, through uh, the efforts that Senator Portman described uh, with Debt for Nature Swaps, the Bipartisan Climate Solutions Caucus. Um, but going forward, I think it's important for the Hill audience to understand that, you know, forests are not a niche issue. They really um, 
it's a cross-cutting issue that touches on so many areas of importance to both sides of the aisle. You know, it touches on trade, as, as Rick discussed, um, climate, zoonotic diseases such as Ebola, AIDS, um, and COVID-19. Um, it touches on, you know, corruption and, and law enforcement in countries abroad. Um, and it's also, you know, an issue central to agriculture and, and consumers, you know, as, as Rick mentioned, um, consumers are unwittingly buying products that uh, are contributing to deforestation abroad. Um, and so, you know, we can find forests in a number of different types of legislation. Uh, those that touch on those issues, we can find forests in previous and current climate bills. Uh, it's also an area that can be found in the annual appropriations process. There's obviously opportunity um, to have forests be more part of the appropriations process. And so that's something that I know is, is moving right now that the Hill audience is interested in. So I guess I would close by just saying to, to think about, you know, forests touch on so many issues, um, both domestically and internationally. And um, we can think creatively about how to make sure forests are more included in appropriations and legislation going forward. I agree. And I think that's something really good for our Hill audience to keep in mind that um, forest legislation um, can be found um, uh, on a number of initiatives. So it's really important to look out for that. Um, well, we're at time, so we have to wrap our conversation there, unfortunately, but um, I do encourage our listeners to reach out to our expert panelists or myself if you have any questions left unanswered, and I thank, thank everybody for tuning in this morning. Um, thanks also to Senator Portman for sharing remarks at the start of our program and for his leadership in Congress. Uh, thanks also to our keynote speaker, the Norwegian climate minister, for joining with his remarks on his country's efforts working internationally um, in, corporate, in cooperation with countries like the United States to support uh, tropical forests. Uh, and then also, last but not least, thanks to our experts, uh, Diana Movius with Climate Advisors and Rick Jacobson with the Environmental Investigation Industry for being so generous with your time and insights. Uh, we'll continue this ongoing conversation about bipartisan forestry solutions in two weeks. Uh, we'll feature remarks with the ranking member of the House Agriculture Committee, uh, Congressman G.T. Thompson of Pennsylvania. Uh, we'll also have a panel discussion of industry experts who will share their thoughts on voluntary carbon markets. So please don't hesitate to reach out to ICCF in the meantime. We're at internationalconservation.org. Thank you.